Well, shooters and reloaders out there, good morning to all of you. It's Fortune Cookie 45LC coming to you from the hot lead zone. And uh, this morning I'd like to do uh, uh, hello to Gun Fun ZS. And uh, this hat is kind of like makes me think about Gun Fun ZS because in addition to uh, him being a shooter and reloader and bullet caster and all that kind of thing, uh, he's also one of the uh, great friends of the shooting community. But anyway, he's also a dancer. Well, I'm doing a dance uh, performance with this group. And they decided that they wanted to go out and get a costume. So yesterday we went out and did a group buy to get a, get a costume coordinated. And uh, this hat's part of that. I never would have bought this hat otherwise because uh, Jan thinks that it makes me look like a leprechaun. And um, I think I look like a truncated cone hornady bullet with this hat on. But at any rate... Uh, hi to Gun Fun, and I know you're doing your dancing, and so am I. So, but that's not the reason we're doing this um, this video because it happens to be that there's a Seattle uh, theme to this video. Gun Fun ZS is in the Seattle area, and uh, that's the great state of Washington, don't you know? But uh, turns out that there are great similarities between Seattle and uh, the Bay Area. Because, you see, Seattle is sitting right here, and then there's Puget Sound, and over here, there's the Kitsap Peninsula, and there's all these towns and cities on this side. Well, here in the Bay Area, we got San Francisco, and then we got the, the Bay, and then the East Bay is over here. And the East Bay, of course, has all these cities and towns. So it's kind of like a very similar situation. And there are ferry boats that go back and forth, just like in Seattle. So there's a lot of similarity between our areas. Well, the Seattle area is also the home of a lot of our, our shooting community friends. Turns out that, that across the Puget Sound from Seattle, the Kitsap Peninsula, is also the home of uh, Nick J. And so, I'd like to say hi to Nick J and his lovely wife, Pam. So, uh, what Nick did was he went ahead and sent me a, a little gift. And so, I'd like to commemorate this gift and kind of recognize it by doing a coffee chat with uh, Nick today. It's a personal coffee chat with Nick. Now, you know, a lot of shooters and reloaders have done coffee chats uh, recently, but the popularity of doing them has kind of fallen out of favor a little bit, but since we keep on drinking coffee, I like to do a coffee chat with Nick, kind of like a personal coffee uh, uh, meeting with Nick. And then, of course, the rest of you out there are very welcome to look in on this. But this is about what Nick sent me, and I thought it was very thoughtful what he sent me, so let's go over this. Well, so I got my coffee right here. Hmm. That's good coffee, especially when you drink it out of a favorite mug. This mug happens to be from the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which is located down in Monterey, California. And that was famous because it was the location for the shooting of the movie Star Trek The Voyage Home. That was about the whales, as you recall. But anyway, well, let's begin with this. What Nick sent me was this very nice MEC label. This could be put on a, a hat or a jacket uh, or just kept on the reloading bench. So uh, thanks Nick for that. It's kind of nice to get that. But then Nick sent me some collectible cartridges. And so he obviously owns a 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum. That's a round that I don't have. But these are reloads. They're not factory rounds. But uh, this one's loaded with a, uh, feels like somewhere around a 350, 375 grain um, jacketed soft point bullet. And then this one, of course, has the real heavyweight wide flat nose cast lead bullet that I'm sure is very hard. Let's check it out. Yep, doesn't dent. So that's about BHN 18, 19, 20, somewhere around there. 
and it's heavy. My guess is that's somewhere around 700 grains. So uh, this is a nice uh, cartridge to add to my collection. Thanks, Nick. But then he sent me a very interesting cartridge. That's this one right here. And uh, when I first saw it, I thought it was a 38 uh, Long Colt. And uh, turns out it's not. It's actually a 38 Webley. And of course that's famous because the United Kingdom, Great Britain, had the Webley revolver uh, that served them through a couple of world wars and and uh, it's a top rake revolver that uh, you all know has that Webley look to it but the original chambering was 455 Webley and uh, this was the uh, 38 Webley that came out when they uh, discontinued the use of the 455 right after World War II. And the 38 Webley served the military and police of the uh, uh, British, the United Kingdom, right up until the middle 1960s. But this is a nice example of a 38 Webley case. I should have recognized it because it uh, is a little bit shorter than the 38 Long Colt and the nose profile of 38 Long Colt wasn't like this. This is kind of like a, almost a semi-spitzer, but there you go. Now, when I saw this, my first thought was, wow, Nick actually sent me a Kurtz round. Because that looks like the famous Kurtz round from World War II. Uh, as you know, that's the one that spurred the development of the 7.62 by 39 round from the Soviet Union. It's the first intermediate cartridge if you don't argue about the 30 carbine, of course. But this was the intermediate cartridge that was chambered in the Sturmgewehr uh, 44 back at the end of World War II that the Germans developed that turned into uh, all of our uh, selective fire assault weapons that we have today in the military and police. But is this a Kurtz round or not? Because what face you out is a soft point bullet. The Kurtz round didn't have a soft point bullet. Well I went ahead and measured this and it's, it's an 8 millimeter and the cartridge case length is exactly what the Kurtz is. The head stamp is military and it's got the military crimp. This looks like a original primer. So my guess is that the bullet was pulled and a soft point bullet was substituted in there. But uh, that's a Kurtz round. So uh, amazing that Nick uh, J has a uh, Kurtz but maybe he has a, a cartridge collection that has a Kurtz in there. But this is going to be a prize addition to my cartridge collection. Now incidentally, interesting story about the Kurtz. My friend Mo, on one of his travels, actually wound up finding an old Kurtz round that was kind of corroded and uh, he didn't really know what it was, but he stuck it in his pocket and somehow it got caught up into the lining inside the pocket and it was just there and uh, didn't, he didn't know it was there. Well, one day he was wearing that jacket uh, on a airplane flight and it was discovered and it caused all kinds of trouble for him. They, had, they actually took him out to a private room and questioned him uh, ad infinitum and they suspected him of being a terrorist even though he didn't look like a terrorist but what's a terrorist look like these days? But anyway, he, um, he suffered a, quite a bit of, uh, of delay all because he had a Kurtz round stuck in his jacket lining. That's an interesting story about the, about the Kurtz. He, but he doesn't have it now because they confiscated it, of course. But now, look what Nick has sent me, and that is, look at these. These are disintegrating links, and they are for 20 millimeter cannon shells. So these links connect like this, and in fact, here's three of them all joined together.
And so these would be spitting out of Orlikon 20 millimeter cannons. But, and Nick also, of course, then sent me the actual 20 millimeter empty cannon shells. And these were actually in the disintegrating link on that little short link, but I took it apart because I didn't want to take these 20 millimeter cannon shells out to show you. The reason why I think they were actual fired in World War II was that they have primer strikes. So you're looking at the Orlikon 20 millimeter cannon, probably fired on board ships. Or they might be airplane uh, 20 millimeters, but the thing about it is that the empties would have been ejected out of the airplane, so you don't recover those. But on shipboard, you would recover them. There are the primer strikes. The current 20 millimeter uh, rotating cannon, the Vulcan cannons that we have, are electrically primed. So they're electrically fired. You wouldn't see a primer strike. So these probably are old 20 millimeter cannon shells. So I really thank Nick for sending me these. These are really nice keepsakes. And a great addition to anyone's cartridge collection. Now they got a little rust on them, especially where the the uh, links were, so there's some corrosion, and also in the rim area there's corrosion as you can see there. Incidentally, the 20 millimeter cannon is very pertinent to U.S. shooters and reloaders because that was the source of 4831 powder. That was 20 millimeter cannon powder, and Bruce Hodgson bought up huge amounts of surplus 4831 powder to make available to reloaders. So uh, always noteworthy. Now as you all know Bruce Hodgden also bought up huge quantities of the other surplus gunpowder and that is 4895 that was used in the 30-06 ammo. He made that available to US shooters also and reloaders and it actually kicked off the uh, activity of reloading back in the 1940s, 1950s. And then Nick sent me this great roof flashing. This is uh, pure lead, very flexible, and you can kind of roll it up and feed it into a casting pot. So uh, thanks Nick for that. This looks like roof flashing, but uh, I can't imagine it being anything else but that. But that's a good example of uh, lead roof flashing, pure lead. And then Nick sent me these great ingots that were made out of that roof flashing. And these were made out of a kind of a cooking uh, cupcake or a little cake mold. And uh, so if you like, like to have this shape, they're really nice. I would use these to put into the casting pot first to, uh, to begin a casting session. Well, ingots this big have a problem because when you add it to a casting pot during a casting session, it will chill your alloy to the point where it will slow down your casting. However, you could compensate by putting this on a hot plate and the hot plate actually heating it up to about 400 degrees or so and then when you added that to your, your casting pot, it would not chill your alloy. So you could do it that way. But anyway, thanks to Nick for these. These are, these are beautiful ingots and it's probably pure lead. Uh, if it's made from that roof flashing, this, will, this is pure lead. Of course, I could check it by doing a fingernail test. Yep! You see how the fingernail dented that? That is pure lead. This is nice for making shotgun slugs and also muzzle loading, which I don't do, but black powder, this is right up the black powder shooter's alley. So uh, these are nice ingots. Appreciate that from Nick. So finally, Nick gave me this, this container that's available from Home Depot. It's a nice container, maybe a little light in plastic for putting cast bullets in, but this is a great container for holding uh, brass this kind of thing. So, uh, from Home Depot. Thanks, Nick. Well, Nick, I really enjoyed this coffee chat. I hope you and Pam have a great day. But anyway, thanks again for all this stuff and uh, appreciate it. And the rest of you out there, 
Have a very fine day, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.